right, here we go. It's 12 noon. It's Think Tech Hawaii. It's Energy 808, the cutting edge. It's Peter Rossig, the spokesman for Hawaiian Electric. Hi, Peter. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to see you, Jay. Good to be here. Lots of stuff going going on. Let's talk about the uh, Aloha United Way first. Okay. Uh, Hawaiian Electric gave a, a substantial donation to Aloha United Way. Uh, what was that about? Well, we know that there are a lot of our customers who are hurting. Uh, we know that because they're unable to pay their utility bills, uh, either the electric bill or their water bill or their gas bill. And, uh, you know, we, we're, these are our long-term customers. These are our friends and neighbors. So, uh, you know, we've been looking for a variety of things to do, but one of the best things we thought was to give some direct money to people who could use it to get, you know, get started repaying whatever they owe. So, we made a donation of uh, $2 million. And when I say we, I should say it was the shareholders. This money came out of money that would have been paid to shareholders as dividends. So uh, we gave $2 million. We asked the United Way, Aloha United Way to, to manage things because we didn't want to be in a situation of saying you get it, you don't get it and so forth. So they managed that. They took applications and, and I think we were, surprised, pleasantly and unpleasantly surprised that the whole $2 million was spoken for within about two days. Uh, people heard about it, people signed up for it. Uh, clearly there is a, uh, there, there's a need for this. So the fund continues and people are contributing, people can contribute individually. Uh, we're talking to some other customers about getting them to other companies, I should say, we're talking to them about making a donation, and I think we'll see some more money going into that fund. But clearly, uh, you know, there is a, a real hurt out there, as I think we all know from uh, some of the food lines and the unemployment and so forth. But, um, you know, everybody's got to do what they can do. And this was what we could uh, do. And we'll hope to look for other ways uh, to do that. Uh, we know there are, you know, right now there are no uh, disconnections, and that continues at least through the end of March. We're not quite sure whether the commission will extend it or, or not, but uh, we're not interested in disconnecting people. We're not going to, when that disconnection ends, we're not uh, the disconnection moratorium, we're not going to rush out and start doing disconnections. We want people to uh, work with us get online and you'll find a variety of different payment schedules. Are, are they doing that? Because I can imagine just in the human condition, some people will say, ah, I don't have to pay my electric bill, so I won't, even though I could. Well, I, I don't, I think, you know, in Hawaii, generally, we believe when we talk to other utilities, we have a very high rate of payment. Uh, we don't get, uh, you know, we obviously do get people who, who uh, bunk out on their bills, uh, you know, especially if they're going to move away or something the last few months, whatever. But in general, we have people in Hawaii have a high sense of uh, paying what they owe. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, we now have a lot of people who can't do that. So, uh, you know, I'm sure there are some people who are just figuring, well, if I can't, if I'm not going to be disconnected, why should I bother paying? And there are many other people who are making a decision every day, food on the table, uh, rent, uh, medicine. And uh, if they can, if they have to put off their utility bills, uh, you know, so be it. We, we are hoping that they will contact us. No shame, no shame to ask. You know, we've, we've made very tried a big campaign about no shame to ask uh and uh you know we'll work out a payment plan even if it's a little bit even if it stretches out over a year or, or, or longer who knows um but, so, you know we don't we don't really know the state of the economy i, I don't i think we get information about the the nature of um you know the covid although it's very interesting civil beat said they weren't going to carry the reports anymore because it wasn't reliable uh, that's very interesting. And, you know, and then you get these press conferences and you get statements on the national level. But, but as for the economy itself, metrics, reliable metrics that you can use as planning points, it's hard to find them. And, and you know, my own theory is that we, we, have yet, we have yet to reach a tipping point. We don't know what's going to happen with the economy, either in the country or the state. There's been so much, um, you know, damage and close, 
permanent closing. And I don't think you know either. So here you are in a situation where um, you know, you're, you're not able to collect your regular payments or some of them, maybe many of them. Um, and you still have to do business and generate the electricity and pay your bills, okay? And you don't know when it's coming back or when it comes back, whether it's, you know, it's, it's gonna be robust or not. Um, and so, you know, just looking in from the outside, you must be taking a loss and the duration of the loss is indeterminate, pretty much. We can say the fall, but I wouldn't have all that much confidence. Even, even the White House doesn't have that much confidence in the fall. So the question is, you know, how do you make up for this? You're taking a loss every day, Peter. How do you make up for it? Well, as you know, Jay, a loss is uh, something on the books. Uh, you know, we have people that are 30 days behind, 60 days behind, 90 days behind on their payments. And those go to the bottom line as, as a, you know, as a, as a theoretical asset that eventually we expect some or all of which will be paid. I got to say, considering we are, um, you know, a quasi public, uh, well, we're a public utility with, uh, in some ways, you know, heavily regulated, but I don't think people need at this stage to worry about Hawaiian Electric going out of business. In fact, we're, you know, we, we are surprisingly, uh, we're surprising ourselves, I think, that we're, we are not doing, you know, we're not doing worse. We're not, uh, as a company, we will we will get through, and I don't think it, we're gonna. You have to worry about us closing up someday, like the little mom and pop restaurant on the corner, or uh, that kind of thing. This is not our kind of. That's not the kind of company we are. For sure, there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and I agree with you. I mean, you talk about data, but let's face it: even in normal times, uh, you know, the data collection is has a has a lag factor, and you know, sometimes uh, the, the the federal government will come out six months later and say, "Well, we have to correct the figures from six months ago because we we have new data." And, and I'm I am sure, as you are, I think that the the actual death toll is probably higher. Uh, we've seen that, you know, just the number of deaths, uh, not counting the COVID deaths, are, 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 is higher than it would have been in a normal year. And we know there are probably more people getting sick, some of whom are not coming forward. You know, we, we're used to this kind of, of uh, I, I call it kind of fake science, but I mean, we're used to this impression that we know what's happening all, all around us all the time. We don't. Uh, we just have a, a pretty good idea. And, you know, that's what we're planning for, a pretty good idea of what we think is going to happen. Uh, things change. We, As I said, the commission uh, may or may not decide to extend that moratorium on disconnections. Uh, you know, so we don't know. We don't know either what is actually happening or what's going to happen. All we can do is plan for, you know, what we can plan for the best way we can. And our major concern now, as I said, is not putting anybody in the situation where they need to be disconnected. Uh, it seems to me that when you when you have a crisis like this, an ongoing crisis, I'm, I'm talking about a mom and pop, and I'm talking about a big utility all the same, um, it, 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 it wakes you up, it alerts you. And all of a sudden, you know, your sensors about what's going on in the world are activated yeah more than they were before, because you know you have to make plans, you know it's dynamic, it's changing, what you know today may not be what, you know, what happens tomorrow, and so forth. And, you know, it seems to me that the inquiry into the circumstances of our community is sharper. Am I right? It's sharper than it would normally be, simply because you don't know, uh, you know there's going to be big changes, but you don't know what. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, we are so kind of used to the day in, day out that we forget kind of how vulnerable this whole uh, structure we have, uh, you know, that we've built on uh, can be. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we're certainly learning every day. One of the things that's come out of this crisis of our, of our customers, excuse me, is that we have formed uh, what we call an LMI advisory council. We have an advisory council, one on each island, um, of uh, people who are in the business of dealing with low and middle income people. And uh, because we know, though, I mean, they're the ones that are primarily not being able to make their bills. Uh, a lot of people are doing pretty well and they're to handling their bills just fine. The, the, I think the inequality split in our community has become a, even more 
uh, even more extreme and even more invisible than ever before. So we didn't know, uh, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of experience that we knew what it was, you know, typically X number of people are 30 days late, X number of people are 60. We don't really know, have a very good vision of that. So uh, Vice President uh, uh, Shelley Kimura and uh, people working with her formed these LMI councils, advisory councils. And they're telling us what's going on, helping to tell us. They're helping to tell us what works and what doesn't work, what, what's needed and what isn't needed. And a year ago, a year and a half ago, you know, we were kind of uh, uh, blissfully ignorant of a lot of that because we had no real reason. Now we've got to really pay attention because we don't want anybody in a situation where um, they default because we didn't do all we could to help them. So disconnect uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, we're, we're in a whole new world. There's no question of that. Disconnected in any way with the article in the paper about the, uh, I don't recall reorganization, but the, um, the restatement of roles uh, where Scott's you is taking over in some way on, on the neighborhood. Well, what happened there and, and is it connected? It's not really connected because it's something, this is kind of the culmination of, a, of something that's been going on since Alan Oshima was president, maybe even a little earlier. We've been trying to make our company more efficient. Uh, and you'll remember back when the PUC did the audit and came out and said, you know, you, you've, you've got to make this, this organization more efficient. Uh, you've got to, uh, you know, kind of tighten your belt. And this was before COVID. If anything, COVID has made it more important, but we've been coming this way for a long time. We call it the one company uh, process. And uh, so we used to have, uh, you know, three presidents. We had a president of Hawaiian Electric, we had a president of Maori Electric, and we had a president of Hawaii Island, uh, of Hawaii Electric Light Company. And when Jay Ignacio retired a few years ago, a very good guy who we all still miss, uh, the two neighbor islands were combined under one president. Uh, and that, and uh, that was Sharon Suzuki, who was originally the Maori president. And now that she's retiring, uh, we're kind of completing the, the process. Everybody is going to be part of one Hawaiian electric. We don't, you know, obviously we don't, uh, we, we recognize Maui and, and Hawaii Island are different places, but uh, we are talking about one company all called Hawaiian Electric. Uh, and we're, we are uh, trying in every way we can. For example, just, just as, uh, you know, in my department, we have the public relations and communications and community department, all of those which had been separate in each island are coming together under one director. And we'll have people on Maui and we'll have people on Hawaii Island, but we'll be working as a team. And the same thing goes even for things like running the plants, even though some plants are on Hawaii Island, some plants are on Maui, one person will be responsible, not necessarily on Oahu, I might add. Uh, for example, the guy that runs our entire fleet for all three islands is located in Hilo. And he runs the fleet for everybody, which is something you can do uh, with with electronics now and with meetings. Sure, and so sure. So, that sounds very sensible to me. Well, it's not only sensible; it's inevitable. Uh, the PUC told us we had to do it. We knew we had to do it. And uh, you know, we can argue about whether this we should save a buck here or a buck there. But we we can't continue to operate the way we operated before. Uh, we're still growing the company because we still have demands on us, and we still have you know work we have to do. But uh, we've got to just be very much smarter and now. Uh, you know, before people were hired kind of, you know, I don't want to say willy nilly, but I would say, you know, a lot of different people had the ability to authorize a hiring. Now everything, all three companies, all three islands, all five islands actually, counting Molokai and Lanai, you know, if there's going to be a hiring, if somebody retires or resigns, uh, it goes up to the committee and one central committee says, uh, you don't need this person, find somebody else to do it, or we will hire somebody. And it's all being very carefully monitored. We're not gonna, we're not gonna leave, you know, vital positions empty, but we're not going to just kind of automatically say, well, we had somebody doing that before, we'll have somebody doing it again. We'll say, what were they doing? Who can do it? Can we, can we get somebody, uh, you know, and, and there again, there's somebody, one, one of the people on, on uh, Maui Island is really the kind of financial director for, uh, you know, for across the islands. 
uh, no reason it has to be on Oahu. I think that's important. I know neighbor island people can get a little sensitive, and I think rightfully sensitive. Oh yeah, Oahu is going to make all the decisions, but that's not the case. Uh, we have people on Maui and we have people on Hawaii Island who are making decisions and exercising leadership for the whole company. Obviously, you know, the big, the big dog is here on Oahu, no question about that. But there are plenty of good people and plenty of people who can make decisions across all companies, across think, all I islands. I think that's great, Peter. It's, it's, it, it, it's the future. It's, it's inevitable, I think. But we're, and again, COVID has certainly accelerated that or put us in a position where, you know, we do have to watch every penny uh, very carefully because we don't want to be in a situation where, uh, you know, we can't get, we need to have custom, we need to have people willing to buy our stock so that we can get the money to do the repairs and do the additions. We have to have a good stock showing. We have to pay a good dividend. And fortunately, we have people at HEI who manage that. But we can't let the company somehow slide uh, because we're, oh, well, it's COVID. Uh, are, got, are you doing yeah. more, are you doing more uh, uh, Zoom management across the island? Are, oh, are you spending more time on Zoom? Absolutely. But again, it was something that started before COVID because we were doing this one company thing. We already had a good deal of, of uh, telecommunications uh, going on, meetings that were happening on on what we WebEx or whatever we were using. The difference is now for since about last March, uh, just about half of our employees are at home. So uh, whereas before you might go into a big conference or conference room and you know 20 people would sit in a conference room in, in Oahu and five people would sit in a conference room on Maui and five people would sit in the conference room on, on the big island. Now uh, we're all coming together from our various homes and almost no one goes into the office except you know to pick up the mail and sign some sign some paychecks, I hope. So uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, what we started, and fortunately we didn't have to start from scratch, but what started as telemeetings of groups of people in the offices on each island have now become telemeetings and Zoom and WebEx and so forth. I mean, I just, there, I've had two, before I had the pleasure of talking to you, I was on two other Zoom meetings, uh, WebEx meetings this morning. Monday morning, everybody's trying to figure out what we got to do this week and we've got to make plans for the next month and so forth. So yeah, these things, these things are likely to continue after we get out of the woods on COVID. Absolutely. absolutely. They're more efficient. Yeah, but they're efficient. At, you know, they're not a hundred percent pleasant. It's not like being in a room with somebody because, you know, I can't look to my right and snicker with somebody when you know i can't uh, i can't pass a note to the guy sitting to my left and saying who is this idiot that's talking to us but on the other hand we're you know we look at each other and we see each other and there are more and more ways to interact i don't think whatever happens i don't think everybody's going to go back to work in an office one day uh i don't want to i frankly i, I don't want to go back to that cubicle i'm very happy working from home I'm, i think i'm efficient I get it done, uh, and I, you know, just between the two of us, while I'm waiting for somebody to give me what I need, if I'm in the office, I've got to be busy. And you know, if I'm at home and I, I give somebody a document and say, "Will you edit this for me?" and they'll say, "Yeah, I'll get back to you in an hour." Well, I can do something else. And you know, very frankly, people are taking care of family, people are taking care of kids, and I don't think we're going to all go back to work one day as uh. we were before. And it's a better life. And it's also, you know, more efficient, obviously, for business. Let me well, let me I, go to a, a big yeah. news event I want to okay. ask you about. <clears throat> and that is, uh, you know, we had this storm, which was uh, somewhat predictable, maybe somewhat not predictable uh, in Texas. <clears throat> and we've had, you know, crises, call well, them electrical generation crises, grid crises in Texas and, and also in California. And um, uh, do you... Do you understand from the utility point of view what has happened in Texas that they should have this crisis? Well, I think I understand part of it, and that is, uh, like Hawaii, Texas has their entire grid system contained within their state. And we have no choice. We're a bunch of islands out in the middle of the Pacific. So we're not connected to any other utility. We're all within the state. 
and, but they made a choice and they made a choice uh, to, uh, to keep all, virtually all of, I think about 90% of all the, all the circuits, all the grids in Texas are contained within the state. So there is no interstate commerce. They don't have to deal with the federal government. And, uh, you know, that was a big uh, claim of, uh, of bragging and, and, you know, we're, don't mess with Texas. You know, you, you're familiar with the attitude. And unfortunately, they also completely deregulated uh, to the point that there is no, virtually no control over uh, companies, what they charge and so forth. Meanwhile, they have- the Texas is where the Wheeler Doctrine was, was organized. Remember that one? And that's an expression of the same there, sort of thing. Yeah, so there, there are companies that can sell directly to customers and ignore the grid or use the grid and, and pay something for it. Uh, meanwhile, they have a energy, you know, they have an energy economy, but a lot of that is exported out of the state. So they send natural gas out of the state with no controls, no way of saying, you got to take care of our, whole, our, of our Texas customers first. So the result is, and they had it 10 years ago, they had a, uh, not quite so severe, but they had a severe cold snap and they had a lot of outages and a lot of problems. And the the federal government and people within Texas said, you know, we've got to put some heaters on these natural gas pipelines because they freeze up. And uh, Texas ignored it. They didn't do that. And now today they are suffering the consequences of that. Here in Hawaii, um, you know, if we have a, we have our share of natural disasters here, as you know, we have hurricanes, we have uh, earthquakes, we have tsunami. Uh, but when we have an experience, we get right in there and say, what happened and how can we fix it so that next time it's not so severe? So, you know, a couple of years ago, well, 2014, actually, Hurricane Izell came along, wiped out about half the, the electricity service on Hawaii Island. And first of all, we got it back much more quickly than anybody could imagine because we've been preparing for it, we've been training for it. And secondly, we learned a lot. And now one of the things we talk about all the time, we talk about renewable energy, of course, we talk about reliability, but we also talk about resilience. And resilience means that you've got a tougher, stronger grid and it's able to withstand these increasingly wet storms, increasingly windy weather, these hurricanes we're getting. And when it's, and if the power does go down, and it will go down, uh, we're able to recover it more quickly. So we've made resilience a watchword. Texas doesn't seem to have uh, been concerned about that. And now, you know, dozens are dead. Uh, the economy's totally disrupted. People are are uh, living in homes where the, the you know that are are in shambles. It's a it's a tragedy. It's a human tragedy first and foremost. We talk about um, you know um, uh, the the, the uh, benefits of having a, an interconnected grid. I, I can't help but remember uh, the day, and it was what ten or fifteen years ago, uh, when we were all talking about interconnecting the island. Uh, and one of the, I mean, there were various elements pro and con about that, uh, as we know, but one of the elements to me is that an, intercon an interconnection among the islands of Hawaii would make the state in general more resilient. Am I right? Well, it could offer some opportunities for sure. Uh, you know, there's a lot of renewable energy on the neighbor islands, but there's not a lot of demand for it. Uh, Hawaii Island probably has more geothermal resources, uh, but uh, and Maui may even have some geothermal resources. It's obviously easier to locate a wind farm on Hawaii Island and Maui Island than it is here on Oahu. So yeah, there is definitely an, uh, a, the potential. The problem was and is that it's very expensive to interconnect islands across very, very windy and, and stormy and, and violent uh, straits as we have between the islands here. Uh, and you know, nothing is perfect. In the Northeast, you'll remember a few years ago, a small problem that connect, caused an outage, the outage turned into a domino and the entire Northeast, 50 million people, I think, I forget the numbers, were out without power. So that's the downside of interconnection, no question. It's not purely one thing or the other, but in general, uh, across the continental United States, uh, people have seen the value of interconnection because uh, if you have enough, if you don't have enough power one day, 
by interconnections, you can bring power from other states. And if you have too much power for whatever reason, you can sell to other states and you can support, you know, people can plan their, for example, they can plan their maintenance, knowing that even though a major power plant on their on their grid is going to be down, they have a resource that can can uh, replace that. So that overall, there are certainly more advantages to an interconnection. But Texas was, you know, Texas, first of all, thought they were big enough that they were and, and you know, there are a lot of that's a fairly large grid, but they may mainly they didn't want to have the federal government telling them what they had to do. And but the, uh, but the problem is that you know, this teaches us, Texas, I hope, teaches us something. And, we'll and the magic word is infrastructure, that you, you know, Spencer Abram, at the time of that Northeast power failure a few years ago, was the Secretary of um, Energy. And I remember him saying, it, it drills into my head, I remember him saying, hey, you know, we put this grid together 20, 30 years ago, and we have really not updated it in the Northeast, and you have to update your infrastructure with the latest technology, and make sure that it works against the latest threats. And if you don't do that, you get Texas. Um, right. So I think it's a lesson to everyone about infrastructure is, is inherent in, in sustainability and resilience. Right, absolutely. And, and I think, uh, you know, there's another one other aspect I should mention. In Texas, um, they chiefly had problems with generation. They're, they're, uh, Small number of their wind turbines were not were out of service. Not a big, you know, wind turbines in the winter don't generate that much anyway. So, but uh, mostly natural gas was frozen in the pipelines, and they couldn't generate the electricity. Uh, and you know, the storm certainly affected the grid to a certain extent, but the wires were not their main problem. Here in Hawaii, our generation is pretty solid. Uh, we built our power plants in such a way that they're uh, and by and large, they do a good job, but we have winds, we have storms, and we have, you know, we're as fast as we can upgrade the, the wires, we still are, uh, you know, have a way to go. And there's no way you can completely upgrade uh, to prevent any kind of a storm that's going to come along. So here in Hawaii, when we have problems, it tends to be problems of distribution, getting the electricity from the generation out to the customer. In Texas, they primarily had a generation problem right. because they deregulated and they, you know, you're hearing about these people getting, you know, I mean, the, the, the $200,000 electric bill is supposedly a mistake, but there are people who are getting bills of $10,000, $17,000 because they don't have a regulated system. We couldn't, you know, we, we don't do that. We couldn't do that because our system is pretty tightly regulated and we don't, we can't just make a profit uh, you know, willy nilly, we have to uh, take into account the customer. But they, they you know, they took that away. In, in, in the, this goes back, I think, in Texas to the Enron days. You know, uh, they they opened up the system and they didn't regulate it. And the and the result now is amazingly, if you didn't lose power in Texas, you're going to get a seventeen thousand dollar bill. Yeah, I saw that in the newspaper. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I, I hope I hope they fix that. But can you imagine? You know, your house is in an uninhabitable. You don't have any water. You don't have any any heat. You don't have, and and all of a sudden you open the mail and you get a seventeen thousand dollar bill. You know, I mean, nobody nobody should have to go through that. That's not that's inhumane. That, it that's reminds awful. me of this guy who had COVID and he really had a bad case of COVID. And he was in the hospital for X number of weeks, and and he gets a bill from the hospital for four million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that can make you sick all over again. Well, it would certainly tap your will to live. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean that's just that's just crazy. So anyway, Texas. Let's hope for the people who live in Texas. You know, for the everyday people, not the not the the hotshot politicians, and not the the energy kingpins, but the everyday people who go to work and 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 try to make a life. Let's hope that things get fixed for them, so that the next time this happens, which it will, guaranteed that they don't they're they're better prepared and they don't suffer so much. It's they've got to they've got to learn, and the country has to learn. You know, there there are yeah. I'm sure there are other mm, 
you know, such incidents waiting to happen. But we have a few minutes left, Peter, and I want to talk about RPS. Okay. Uh, you got some numbers on RPS, which is a, what is it? The renewable energy used by customers as a percentage of total utility sales. Right. And they're pretty good right now. And you made a report about it. I guess it was a press release. Can you talk about that, about how well we're doing on RPS? Sure. You know, the the, the state has a, an RPS, renewable energy mandate and requirement that we, by the end of 2020, the end of last year, we needed to reach 30%. And uh, when we finally added up the numbers, we found we reached 35%, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. I mean, that's really, we were a little surprised ourselves. Even without COVID, had there been no uh, had there been no uh, uh, COVID, which resulted in some decline of, of energy use, we would have been at 32%. So we beat the mandate, we beat the requirement, and we're very, very proud of that. Uh, we meet, you know, here on Oahu, we're at about 31%, which is quite amazing because Oahu is energy challenged in terms of renewable energy. On Maui, they hit 51% which is the first time anybody, uh, Maui County has gone over 50%. So of the, all the electricity used by all the customers on Maui Island, over half of that came from renewable sources, from wind, from biofuels, uh, and, and so forth. And then on Hawaii Island, they were at 43%. And that was without Puna Geothermal. No Puna Geothermal till about last November, I think, uh, October, November, they started generating from there again. So even without having their primary renewable resource, their wind and their solar, uh, you know, their biofuels and you know, got them to, to an incredible uh, 43%. So, uh, you know, I think, and, and, you know, we're justifiably proud about it and we're bragging about it, but I gotta say, this is an accomplishment of a lot of people who put solar on their roof. This is an accomplishment of a lot of people who said, I'm gonna make a commitment to Hawaii Island. I'm gonna build a wind farm. I'm gonna build a, uh, a solar farm. I'm gonna to come to Hawaii, even though they say it's a bad place to do business. I'm gonna come there, I'm gonna make an investment and I'm gonna to contribute to this. So as much as it's Hawaiian Electric, which gets to kind of claim you know, the good news and we're glad to be out there shouting about it, this is really a triumph of a lot, a lot of people. We have something like 80,000 plus people, uh, customers in our five, uh, across our five islands put solar on their roof. That's just incredible. Is this and, a good uh, time to do that, Peter? Yeah, it's a great time. As a matter of fact, you know, we, we thought, again, going back a year, we were all kind of worried, especially the solar industry. They were worried that, you know, all of a sudden their business would dry up and it would be awful. So. We've gone quite the other way. We had a in in 2020 we had a 55 percent increase in solar uh, systems accepted on our grids, something like 6,000 plus, because people kind of looked around and the people who can afford it and who have a single family home and they're spending a lot more time there and they looked around and they said this is a good this is a good time to put solar on our roof. And we're, we're doing everything we can to make that go forward. We've just launched what we call Quick Connect, which means it's going back to the old days, really. In the old days, 10, 12 years ago, you put a solar system on your roof and then you got around and sent an application to Hawaiian Electric. So you got approval and you, we knew we need to know that it's out there and so forth. We had to stop that because it was getting out of hand and you know we had a very, very rapid and very dramatic increase, but now we're going back to that. If you meet certain qualifications, uh, you can, uh, and you can put a solar system on your roof. If you're on the kind of a circuit that has capacity, uh, you can go up to 25 kW a solar system and file your application later. If you're not on a, on a circuit that has a lot of capacity, you can still put on solar up to 100 kilowatts, but you have to turn it on so it doesn't export, doesn't send any power into our system. But you can take care of your own power and you can start, as soon as that system is ready, you can start saving money because your electric bill is gonna go down. And you know, we're in the only business I know where we encourage people uh, you know, not to buy the product from us, but you know, make your own. I don't think, I never hear Zippy saying, you know, eat less chili, but uh, you know, 
we huh. say to you, if you can, if you can generate power on your roof, and we're going to have other programs if you can't, uh, that you can still participate in. If you can generate power on your roof, go for it. You know, it, it is a unique, you know, it's, we're a regulated utility. As I said before, we're not going out of business. So it's not crazy, it just sounds crazy. But we're the only company I know of who will encourage you. First of all, we'll just tell you, you know, get a better refrigerator so you're not using so much of our electricity. Get a better stove, get a better air conditioner. Don't leave your lights on overnight. We're the only company I know that says use less of our product. And, and you know, uh, so, uh, I mean, maybe healthcare, they say, you know, don't get sick, but uh, so, you know, it's really a great sign of things when we hit 35% renewable energy. And well, we have to take stock, you know, as you go, as you go forward, there are targets to be made. There are, you know, there are events and dynamics that will happen uh, in COVID or beyond COVID. And I hope that uh, you and I can get together again, Peter. Oh, and, and keep tracking on these same issues. Always glad to talk to you, Jay. You know, you're doing, a, as I've said to you before, you know, a long time ago, I sent you a white hat because I think you're you're the guy that's doing a lot of good for this community and you and, you know, not, you're not alone, but you and Civil Beat and the newspaper and the television stations. The only way, especially now that we're kind of locked down and in our homes, uh, you know, we got to still keep track of the, the general welfare what's going on in our community and and how and we all have decisions to make you know the we don't want to leave these decisions to you know whoever to the state or city government we have to make our own decisions we have to all be part of it and the only way we can do that is if we know what what's going on you are a very big part of that uh especially in the energy realm but in others as well and and um you know just the fact that we're we have to do it over zoom instead of sitting around in a coffee shop is unfortunate, but it's a reality and we'll, we'll get through it. Oh. Thank you, Peter. Peter yeah. Ross, uh, spokesman for Hawaiian Electric. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Good to see you, Jay. Take Good care. To see you.